Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Sue Gardner, Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit organization committed to building a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. Wikimedia's flagship product, Wikipedia, has become the largest general reference work ever compiled in human history. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers have contributed more than 14 million encyclopedia articles in 250 languages, all of which can be freely shared and used for any purpose. It is consulted by more than 300 million people every month, making it the fifth most popular web property worldwide. Since her arrival at Wikimedia in 2007, Sue Gardner and team have introduced major initiatives focused on organizational maturity, long-term sustainability, and increased participation, reach, and quality of the Foundation's free knowledge product. And I'd like to thank you, Sue, for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mark. So the Wikimedia Foundation is such an interesting place. It is such an interesting series of projects that, that you bring to bear. All the information is, is freely contributed. All the information is freely available. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the organization through its history and, and where we are today? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'll start by talking a little bit about Wikipedia's origins because it's kind of an interesting story. Um, Jimmy Wales is the founder of Wikipedia. He was an options trader in Chicago who made enough money to retire and live fairly quietly in Clearwater in Florida. So when he moved to Florida, he just was playing around on the internet and starting a couple of different kinds of projects. And he wanted to build an encyclopedia because when he was a little kid, he was very reliant. He was homeschooled. So he read a lot of encyclopedias. He was very interested in them and he wanted to build one. So he wanted it to be online. So he started something called Newpedia. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So he started Newpedia, which was originally going to be built in a fairly traditional model with peer review and academics right. and people who were sanctioned as authorities and they would, you know, articles would go through stages of approval and so forth. So he started with that and it failed immediately. It just didn't work at all because it was just such a slow process and they didn't create enough articles and it just didn't grow. So then he um, discovered the wiki, the notion of the wiki, and decided to build Wikipedia as an entity that would sort of do raw article creation, which would then get pushed into Newpedia, into the sort of authorized, approved version. And one of the things that, that uh, when Jimmy described this to me uh, earlier, he had said that one of the things that drove this was that he didn't have to fund all the infrastructure to create the uh, content. Yeah. So the idea of collaboration and, and the practical reality of, of not having to uh, develop huge amounts of funding initially just to create content that was that was out there was, was yeah no that's exactly right and the thing is nobody knew that that would work right I don't think even Jimmy thought uh, certainly Jimmy didn't think that people spontaneously would come together and create this encyclopedia and it would be a huge success nobody thought that would happen right so nobody actually I don't think believed that amateur content creation people working together to collaborate to create articles would actually result in a high quality encyclopedia so I think everybody was surprised when it actually did work but it did work and so here we are today with 14 million articles as you say and increasingly high quality better quality every day so that was where it started, was um, with Newpedia, which morphed into Wikipedia, which then became the central thing. Wikipedia developed, I think it probably really took off in about 03, maybe mm -hmm. 04. It started to really grow quickly, and there was a, there was a sort of critical mass of gravity, people coming and, and creating new projects um, and adding to Wikipedia. And then other projects started to develop out of that, so little ancillary pieces that didn't really belong in an encyclopedia but were interesting and were also capable of being created through mass collaboration. So Wiktionary came out of that. Um, Wiki Quotes, I think, came out of that as well. Um, and then eventually further offshoots like Wiki News developed as well, right. you know, which were, were sort of adjacent, kind of next to the encyclopedia, but again, not really part of the encyclopedia. Um, the two biggest and I think most interesting projects in addition to Wikipedia, Wikipedia is obviously massively the most popular, right. but the two other particularly interesting projects I think are MediaWiki, which is the wiki software, which is used by hundreds of companies and individuals and nonprofits around the world. It's just a wiki engine that anyone can use, they can modify, they can do what they want with it. And that's also at no cost. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's a broad community of volunteers that contributes to it and builds extensions and so forth. So it's a, it's a living, growing, changing, evolving mm -hmm. um, software engine. 
And then the other, the other property that's pretty interesting is Wikimedia Commons. Do you know that one? No, I don't. Commons is, is sort of invisible to most people, but what it is is an enormous repository. It's a database, a library, an archive of freely licensed images and multimedia files. So there's audio in it, there's video material, and there are tons of images, including illustrations, photographs, um, uh, graphics, and so forth. So they can be used not just on Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects, but because they're freely licensed, they can be used anywhere. So, you know. So all the content is, is freely available. If, if, if I wanted to put up a website and use entirely content from any of your properties, and I guess properties is, is probably not the correct yeah, word, right? Yeah. Uh, but let's let's use it for now. But but any of that, it's it's basically becomes something that I can very that's, easily use without paying a license fee. Yep, and that's very much part of the point, right? So the point is not just to create this fantastic encyclopedia that people everywhere in the world can read, but also to give them power beyond that, to let them share it, to let them modify it, to let them use it to create other works and spin it out. And that, that's very much the point. So not just can people use it for their own purposes, mm -hmm. personally, individually, they can also use it in classrooms, they can use it um, in educational settings of all kinds, and they can also, I think importantly, use it in commercial endeavors as well. The Wikimedia Foundation um, wants to tap into the power of the market and the energy of the market where we can, and so we see all kinds of opportunity for businesses to use our material, which further disseminates it and is good for our mission. It gets the material out there for people, um, and people can make money from it. So in the history, you start off with an idea, it fails. You take a, you take a different take on that idea, mm -hmm. and it succeeds, actually succeeds beyond w anybody's wildest expectations. You build out an infrastructure, which then you itself make freely available to people, and then you use that infrastructure to create all these different uh, projects, but based on the same idea. It's, it's knowledge that people contribute, it's freely available, and uh, basically the barriers to entry are, are, as long as you can get on the internet, you can make a contribution. Yep, that's exactly right. I mean, our origins come out of the free software movement, the free culture movement, the free knowledge movement, and that's the important part. There are really two ways to think about the word free in mm -hmm. the English language. There's free as in beer, right? And <laughs> like that you do not have to pay to use Wikipedia. Right. And then there's free as in speech, right? Which is the notion that you can mix it, you can share it, you can disseminate it, you can change it, you can use it in different ways. And so we're firmly rooted in both of those. Wikipedia will always be free as in beer. People mm -hmm. can always use it. They don't have to pay a fee. They're not monetized in the ways that most web properties are. So we don't monetize the eyeballs, we don't have advertising, we don't sell information about the people They're who use it. They're not monitored either. No, that's right. And so, you know, some properties, um, their business model is predicated on the notion that they'll sell information about you to other entities, right? Either directly or, or, or in sort of mm -hmm. um, secondary ways. And we don't do that. We don't keep any information about the people who use Wikipedia. We don't sell it. There's no ad, ad clicking or, or no. um, any, uh, my name isn't going to appear someplace because I've, I've accessed Wikimedia. You're not collecting information. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, and the reason that there's no advertising on Wikipedia and our other projects is because we want to be used by teachers. Teachers are pretty conservative about advertising. They're pretty leery about commercialization of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so our, our view is that there are lots of places on the internet that are ad-supported, you know, Yelp and Google and so forth. There's all kinds of places, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a classic business model. It makes perfect sense, right? But our view is that there should also be a place on the internet that is like a national park service, right? Mm -hmm. Like a place that's a public space that doesn't have any commercial imperative driving it. And so Wikipedia is very much that. In classic, it's funny, I was at the Aspen Institute recently and I was talking to John Carroll, who yes. used to be the editor mm -hmm. of the LA Times. Right, right, right. Um, and he was talking about, and the group that I was with was talking about um, the wall between church and state, right? Mm -hmm. Advertising and editorial and journalism and how it's always been a bit fraught and a bit complicated, right? Publishers have always tried to restrain themselves from bringing commercial pressure to bear upon the editorial side, or good publishers right. always did. Um, and they weren't always successful, and it was always a bit of an uneasy relationship with a firewall, with a firewall that was often breached. And one of the things that's interesting about Wikipedia is it's a better 
mechanism to do that, right? So in journalism, you wanted to get information to people that was untainted by commercial interest, and it was very, very hard to do, and you often made mistakes, and there was a bit of a slippery slope, and sometimes you did do things that made your readers distrust you. Because so much of the funding was, was from a commercial source? Sure, like if you were like a tiny weekly newspaper, right. and your biggest advertiser was a local hotel, mm -hmm. you would be a little bit leery about writing something that could be perceived as critical of that hotel. It's, just, it's human nature. Nature, right, right. Um, and then that would happen on a bigger scale in bigger in bigger media properties right and there's been obviously all kinds of examples of breaching of that wall and also um, of people just being nervous and being uncomfortable about it and it can be it can be a tricky path to walk mm -hmm. right what's interesting about Wikipedia is I think it solved that problem because it's written by hundred and fifty thousand people all around the world I am theoretically the publisher so I do get people coming to me and wanting to influence the editorial content of Wikipedia, right? Ordinarily, it's people's own articles. So if there's an article about you, you might be a bit upset because you think it's unduly critical right. or there's something in it that you think is, is trivial and shouldn't belong there or whatever. So people come to me, and I know they come to Jimmy all the time, even more so than me. They come to us and they want their article revised or fixed or cleaned up or whatever, and there's nothing that Jimmy or I can do about it, which is really interesting. So the traditional lever was someone pressured the publisher, and then the publisher either held firm and was staunch and a good journalist, or pressured their editorial mm. people, they passed it on, right? I have no one to pass it on to. The Wikipedia editors are all around the world. I may or may not even know their names. I have no pressure I can bring to bear on them. I don't pay their salary. I have no way of influencing what they do, right? That would be terrible if they were irresponsible, bad people who didn't care about quality. But because they're incredibly earnest, serious-minded people who care a lot about quality, it's actually a really nice um, balance that redresses the old problem of publisher interference with editorial content. So the fact that we have no advertising, the fact that we have no commercial imperative, the fact that I have no control over the people who write the encyclopedia, all of that is good and all of that drives quality. So how free is free if it, you actually have servers mm -hmm. and uh, you do have volunteers, but mm -hmm. you also are developing the, the core infrastructure and yeah. I'm sure that can't be done on a part-time basis. You're actually running an organization. How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so all the editorial content is created by volunteers. We could never afford to pay. I mean, we wouldn't pay those people. It's a gift economy. We don't need to pay those people. Um, but we could never afford to. I know that traditional journalistic institutions are having real trouble figuring out how they're going to fund journalism going forward. And the primary problem is that editorial work is really, really expensive. Right. So we have 150,000 Wikipedia editors around the world. We could never afford to pay 150,000 people. And that's driven by the individual's passion, their mm -hmm. knowledge, their commitment. Very often it seems that, that, that a lot of these editors are themselves expert. They're not part-timers. They're, yeah. they're experts in their field. They're writing about things that, they, that, that they've spent their entire careers learning about. Yeah, I think th that is true, and it's also true that they tend to be people who are involved in, um, in education. A lot of our editors are graduate students, so they're reading and thinking and absorbing ideas and reflecting them back and thinking about them and writing term papers right. and essays and so forth. So they're people who are very much involved in the world of scholarship. The editors, we don't pay, we can't pay, we would never pay, they don't want to be paid. I think that their motivations, we've studied them a little bit, and their motivations are partly just that they're smart and they want to be known to be smart by people, so it's a bit show-offy, right? It's like I know everything about this kind of rock or this mollusk or whatever, right? And they want to share that. And it's passion. Yeah, and that's, and that's fantastic because other people do benefit from it. What the Wikimedia Foundation does is we do, we pay the bandwidth bill and we pay for the servers, right? So about half of our budget goes to technology in the form of bandwidth servers and um, staff developers and staff sysadmins maintaining our operations. The other half of our budget goes to other support for the projects that's essential. So for example, Wikimedia Foundation um, has a staff general counsel mm -hmm. who's an old school free speech internet lawyer who defends us and defends the projects against various you know, legal disputes that we might otherwise get ourselves into. He looks after those for us. Um, we also do quite a bit of public outreach work. Increasingly we're doing public outreach mm -hmm. work. Uh, the volunteer community um, 
is stable and it's strong and it's reasonably healthy, but we think that the Wikimedia Foundation has an obligation to constantly attempt to broaden it, to reach out and bring in new people, so to recruit new volunteers, and also to help to um, retain the volunteers that we have today. We haven't done a lot of work in that area historically. We've only had a head of public outreach for about 18 months, um, but we think that there's a lot of fertile terrain there, and we think we can do a lot to broaden out participation in Wikipedia. So for example, 87% um, of our editors are male, mm -hmm. only 13% are female. That's not a good thing, right? That's not healthy. Right. There, there are a hundred different cultural reasons contributing to that. It's nobody's fault. We're very, very grateful for the 150,000 folks who we have. But we think the encyclopedia would be richer and more diverse and broader if it contained more perspectives from more kinds of people. A better example even, probably, is geography. Wikipedia is skews, the editorship skews to Western and Northern Europe and to mm -hmm. North America, and we don't want to become an encyclopedia or a property where people in rich parts of the world tell people in poor parts of the right. world what truth is, right? We want to contain everybody's truth, everybody's experience. We want to be just as detailed and rich in our articles on India as we are in our articles on the UK. How does international expansion get funded? Are those projects that are primarily funded from the wealthier countries, the wealthier areas, into the areas where there's less penetration, or is it a, a self-funding? Uh, yeah, right now, um, the majority of our funding comes from wealthy countries, and the majority of our funding, as you said earlier, comes from individuals, right? So our average donation is, I think, $33, $33 right now. $33 annually, yep. $33. Yep, $33, and um, we have about 150,000 people a year donating to the foundation. So I really like that, right? Because there's, there's, a, there's a philosophical congruence there, right? 150,000 editors and 150,000 donors, everybody brings their crumb to the table, if it's money, if it's time. I like that. Um, and the, the largest group of our donors comes from the United States, which makes sense because we're here, so awareness of the projects is really high here, and also because we're able to offer tax deductibility in the United States, not in most other countries. Um, how I see that changing over time, though, we do have a network of chapters which is predominantly in wealthy countries. Those chapters, in theory, aspirationally, are better situated to fundraise in their countries than the Wikimedia Foundation is, right? It just makes sense. If you're in the UK, you understand how it works there. The same for the Netherlands and so forth. They currently aren't very experienced. They're volunteer-run organizations. Mm -hmm. Only the German chapter actually has staff. The remainder of them, they're just volunteers. But over time, I would like to see them become experts at fundraising in their own context. And then what I think should happen is they should, f f in effect, funnel money to the Wikimedia Foundation that gets funneled to developing countries, right? It makes sense to me that rich countries pay for programs in poor countries. That just seems logical. We also talk to um, major donors and to foundations in developing countries. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's lots of opportunity for those people to directly fund programmatic activities where they are. But we feel like the Wikimedia Foundation needs to be the first institution in some of those countries starting to help people self-organize before those countries really have networks of volunteers or f networks of staff who can actually you know, execute on programmatic activities themselves. And your idea of a chapter-based organization is not sort of a top-down, sort of a headquarters and a, a command and control operation. Is yeah, that's it? right. What, what kind of a model is it? Is it more of a neural network? Is it more they're, of a... They're independent organizations, and okay. so we're all aligned in pursuit of the overall mission, but everybody can take their own path towards fulfillment of that mission. And that's really important because the Wikimedia Foundation, the Wikimedia movement, is not centrally controlled. It's not, it's not a command and control environment at all, right? And you've seen that from yes. watching Jimmy, right? I mean, he's very, he's very careful not to exert his authority in, in, in really authoritarian ways, right? He's very gentle. He's very nudgy around the edges. More of an influencer. Yeah, very much so, yeah. And that's the only way it can work for us, right? That's the only way it can work because they're, they're volunteers and they're there for their own reasons. And we don't need them to all have the same motivator or to have, you know, the same results. The benefit of the decentralized network is that it lives 
it lives in each place. So if something goes wrong in the UK chapter and it has a problem and it can't continue, that doesn't infect the Dutch chapter, the German chapter, the Swedish chapter. You know what I mean? They're independent and therefore they can all experiment, they can all find their path, everybody can flourish in a different way, and that works really well for the pursuit of the mission. Well, one of the things that I find very interesting is how the organization has developed in, in contrast to a command and control organization, it is, it is an organization that is based on influence mm -hmm. and influencers. Mm -hmm. It seems that the Wikimedia Foundation and the community, and indeed the various projects, Wikipedia and so on, operate out of influence. And it almost seems that an individual or an idea gains sufficient influence to reach a tipping point, it tips and then action is taken. Very often not when there is complete consensus. It just has reached a, a, a place of influence and then a decision is reached. As opposed to so many organizations that there's somebody who exercises a function, a chief finance officer or, or a chief executive officer, and they might listen and then they become the person who is deciding. That seems to not quite be the way the yeah. whole community operates. No, it's true. It's really interesting. Um, the perfect example of that is our strategy project, which I think you know a little bit about. Um, I, I came in two years ago, so I spent my first year fixing really simple things, right? I, I moved us from Florida to San Francisco. I hired a CFOO. <laughs> I did a bunch of simple things that are kind of obvious that any organization needs to have in place. Um, and then I spent my second year um, figuring out how we were f doing financially and making sure that we were okay and getting a number of grants and so forth and moving forward some programmatic activities and experimenting in a bunch of ways. And so now I'm at the place where I'm ready to start setting some serious priorities and moving some things forward. So I was talking with my board about that and I knew that in, in our organization, the Wikimedia Movement, there were two ways that I could go at that, right? I could do it in a conventional way, right. in a boardroom with my own staff, and in that way I would drive the activities of 30 people in San Francisco and a guy in Amsterdam and a guy in Sydney, and that wouldn't have a lot of transformative power, you right? You might have been leaving your 150 editors yeah. behind. Yeah, well, there would be 30 people aligned in doing something, right. but 30 people is not very much, right? So clearly, in our context, in the Wikimedia context, there's way more power in influencing a, a huge group of people in a small way even, right, than there is in exerting traditional command and control authority over a small group of people. Right. So we decided that what we would do is we would run a strategy development process that was open, completely open, completely public, completely accessible to anyone that would therefore take advantage of a number of things. No smoke-filled room. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no back room at all, <laughs> you know? It's all public. There's a, there's a wiki, strategy.wikimedia.org, and it's public. And, and what that means is, one thing is we can take advantage of everybody, right? So people love Wikipedia. I'm constantly charmed by people's amount of goodwill towards it, right? I've never worked somewhere where people felt as positively towards the organization that I represent. I love that. So people want to help us. All kinds of people who we would never guess, you know, from around the world want to help. So this enables them to just come in and help. And the other thing that it does is it enables the whole thing to be seen and to be visible. So getting stuff done is all about alignment, right? It's all about we're all going to go in this direction. We're not going to go in 150,000 directions. We're all going to go in one direction. I know we will not come out of our strategy project with 150,000 people all, you know, lined up like Chairman Mao's army or whatever, right, and, and plunging down a road to something. But the more information that people have, the more understanding they have of the activities that other people are conducting, the more they can channel their energies constructively. I don't need to know what they're all doing, right? I don't need to know what Thomas Dalton, 25-year-old Wikipedia editor in London, I don't need to know how he's spending his time. I don't need to exert any authority over how he's spending his time, and vice versa. But if he knows what I'm doing and he knows what I'm thinking, and I know what he's thinking, it's much easier for us to work in concert, right, in, towards the same goals. So we've just begun this project. Um, we, we're currently forming task forces um, of people to work on things. We put out an open call for participation. There are several thousand people already actively participating on the wiki. They're going to do their work over the next six or eight months. Um, I'm already starting to see the shaping of the conversation happening in really useful ways. As part of the project, I should back up just a second. When I came to Wikipedia, 
um, there was no high level understanding, there was no story, right? Everybody was very engaged in their own little piece of work, but no one had a really high level there view. There were 150,000 stories. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And, and you knew the stories of the people adjacent to you, but you didn't have a big picture sense. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to drive over the last couple of years is the development of that story so we understand each other, we understand what we're doing. Right. Um, and as part of the strategy project, we've hired a firm called Bridgespan um, mm -hmm. to, to create high-level views on data and research and analysis. So it's been able to tell us some really simple things, but things that if I'm a Wikipedia editor who spends five hours a week thinking about Wikipedia, I don't know, for example, that we do really, really poorly in China. How would I know that? I may or may not know that participation has been relatively stagnant since about 2006. I might not know that, right? There are a lot of things about how things are working, what's working and what isn't working, that it hasn't been my business to find out for myself. So now we are able to give people that high level data set, mm -hmm. that piece of information, and then they can take that, talk about it, and figure out what to do about our poor performance in China, what to do about our relatively poor performance in India, how do we manage our organizations so that um, we can properly channel the will of the volunteers across all projects, how do new projects get started, how do we maintain innovation in media wiki. So bringing people together, giving them some information, and then trusting them to have good conversations because they're smart people. Where do you think you'll be in, in five years? Where I would like to be, I don't think we'll be here, but I'd like to be, is I'd like Wikipedia to be in the top five web properties in every country in the world. And the reason I want us to be that is because popularity is a measure of relevance and a measure of usefulness, right? There are countries where, for example, China, we're not even in the top 100. We're right. not sufficiently well known by Chinese people. We're not sufficiently trusted by Chinese people. The Chinese Wikipedia is not big enough to be particularly useful. So my view is, if we're in the top five, that suggests that we're relevant, we're high quality, it's a rich enough encyclopedia that you look for something and you find it there. I like the idea that all around the world, people would find Wikipedia useful and relevant enough, sufficiently, that it would be one of the first places that they would go when they're looking for information. That is a very concise strategic mission. <laughs> five, uh, the top five mm -hmm. in every country in the world. Mm -hmm free information for all, an amazing, amazing project. And I am just stunned sometimes about uh, how this all comes together and how wonderfully it, it, it seems to work. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Mr. Gardner, thank you.